Do you know this feeling when everything is fine with you? You begin to unconsciously wind yourself up, thinking that everything cannot be so perfect. It can also be called imposter syndrome. Now I understand that perhaps if I had noticed in time that everything in my life was not so perfect, then I would not have had to face a cheating wife. Team, congratulations on the successful launch of the Private Eye Satellite. Now it's time for the real work to begin. Let's explore the capabilities of this technology so we can secure additional funding for the next five years, declared our team leader, John Sprays. His role involved proposing projects to NASA development teams and convincing potential funders to support them. In this instance, it was the U.S. military footing the bill, so the project remained classified. Only our team and a select few military strategists were aware of Private Eye. I was part of the team due to my expertise in engineering, particularly in designing and assembling advanced camera technology. This was the core focus of PE, a cutting-edge camera system capable of surveillance beyond conventional methods. While it could indeed capture typical scenes like houses and cars, its true power lay in its ability to enhance images to an extraordinary degree. With this technology, we could discern details as specific as the brand of a t-shirt worn by someone mowing their lawn in their backyard. This feat was achieved through my contributions. As Bill Yates, I was responsible for assembling top-tier lens technology and pioneering digital enhancement software to create this groundbreaking system. Indeed, I was a self-professed NASA nerd. Now the next phase awaited us, testing our creation. Once again that year, Jane, my wife, voiced her dissatisfaction with the extended hours I spent at the station, our affectionate moniker for the development lab where our team operated. For heaven's sake, Bill, can't they give you a break just this once? This party is significant. All our friends will be there. They always inquire about you, you know. It was true. Whenever I missed one of Jane's gatherings, inquiries about the absent geek abounded. Yet when I did attend, which was infrequent, I often found myself sidelined while Jane engaged in lively socializing. Despite her protests when I didn't attend, I suspected she secretly welcomed my absence as I tended to cramp her style. Her modus operandi was to mingle with as many people as possible, particularly targeting the affluent, popular, and attractive individuals. I had tried to caution her about her approach, suggesting that some might find her behavior off-putting especially spouses or partners of those she pursued. But she merely laughed it off as harmless fun. Our life together has hit a bit of a standstill since our two children moved out. Mary and Bruce are both in college now, studying aeronautical engineering. We connected on both an academic and familial level. I adored our children. They were intelligent, outgoing, and sensible. It seems they inherited some of Jane's social skills. Jane was somewhat annoyed that they both pursued careers similar to their father's. But what can you do? Jane has always been a stay-at-home mom since my salary was sufficient to support our middle-class lifestyle. She's always been focused on social activities. Fine clothing, extravagant parties, and keeping up with the latest trends were all part of her life. I love Jane. We complimented each other well. While she was outgoing and lively, I was more reserved and contemplative. Our relationship was comfortable, with me focusing on work while Jane took charge of family matters. It worked fine, especially when the kids were at home. However, lately, I sensed cracks in the facade of our marriage. I knew my increased work hours played a role, but I also felt Jane had unmet needs. She seemed discontented with the absence of our children, which she had grown accustomed to. Our bed life was of the same type. Over the years, I tried to bring variety, but Jane hasn't shown much interest. Bill, come check this out. My second in command, Brian, called out. These cameras are just coming online, and the resolution is incredible. Great job, buddy. Glancing at the screen, I saw the feed from PE for the first time. The image quality exceeded that of my HETV at home. The level of detail visible far surpassed our expectations. John's going to be thrilled with this, I remarked. Over the next couple of hours, we tested all of the camera's movement capabilities as the satellite passed over various locations in the country. Fortunately, the public isn't aware of this capability, I reflected. They'd be upset if they knew the level of detail it can capture. That evening, I returned home early, holding a bottle of wine. 
a bouquet of flowers, and some Chinese takeaway food. I must say it was quite romantic. What's the occasion? Jane asked, looking a little flustered when I walked in. She seemed caught off guard like a cat seeing milk on the table. Today I was just celebrating a major success at work. All those long hours spent over the past year have finally paid off. The project was a huge success, and I was rewarded with a fantastic award. No more late nights in the future. Now I hope to stick to the usual routine, from 8 to 5 o'clock. I proudly announced, kissing and hugging her. This is wonderful news, Bill, she said, quickly retreating to the kitchen. I'll be right back. I just need to clean up something at the last moment. I'm sorry. I wasn't expecting you so soon. Usually by the time you get home, I've already finished all the household chores. Could you set the table? With that, she disappeared, leaving me with flowers, wine, and food. I made dinner, poured two glasses of wine, and arranged the flowers before she returned. She managed to take a shower, brush her teeth, and clean up. Thank you, dear, she said. I just needed to load the washing machine. Wow, pork and sweet and sour sauce. My favorite dish. We enjoyed the food, drank wine, and later that night retired to the bedroom. This was our usual procedure. We both had fun and then fell asleep. My analytical mind refused to let go of the persistent feeling that something was off about that evening. The next day at work, I carried on testing PE as usual. On a whim, I asked Brian to position the satellite over our neighborhood. If we were going to spy on anything, I wanted it to be our own house. I felt a twinge of guilt about scrutinizing strangers' homes at this level. As our house came into view, I noticed every detail with clarity. The pool, the trees, the fence in need of repair, the broken roof tile, even the patch of lawn where I mistakenly poured weed killer instead of fertilizer. And there was our driveway, with a brown Porsche parked inside the garage. Nice wheels, Brian remarked. I didn't know you could afford one of those. His comment made me go pale. I was speechless. We can't. I managed to whisper. Oh, damn. Brian breathed out. Brian, zoom in on the license plate, please. We need to look into this further, I said urgently. The plates were clearly visible, VBG 385. Strange, I remarked. If it was just a casual visitor, why would they try to park inside the garage? Jane knows I've been cleaning and organizing it. They could have parked outside like everyone else. Hmm. Sorry, Brian. Please keep this to yourself. I need to deal with it, I said, feeling a sense of urgency. He looked apologetic as he said, Go and do what you need to do, Bill. I'll continue the tests without you. Just go. And so I left. It's only a 30-minute drive home, but today I made it in 20. After parking some distance from the house, I walked leisurely towards our residence. As expected, there was a brown Porsche VGB 385 parked there. It was a car I didn't recognize. None of our friends had such a beauty. I would have recognized him because I cherished a secret dream of someday getting one like him. As I made my way through the house to our bedroom window, I unmistakably caught sounds, heavy breathing, and muffled words that came from Jane. She never made such sounds with me. Could she have been pretending all these years? The sounds gradually subsided as the lovers took a deep breath. I overheard a man ask Jane, Hey, honey, how about you do some mouth work? Yesterday you coped with your task 100%. I had no idea that you were capable of such a thing. Sorry for the pun. Jane chuckled. Jack, you know I love this. I'm enjoying. I almost got caught yesterday. Bill came home early, and I still had something in my mouth. He almost kissed me on the lips, and I didn't even have time to change the bed linen and clean up before he came. I'm going to have to be more careful from now on. He says he will come home at his usual time now, so we won't have as much time as before. Can you believe that? We've had such freedom for the last 10 years, ever since the kids started high school, and now all of a sudden he's coming home earlier, Jane said. The man chuckled, or perhaps it was more of a mockery. Jane, this absent-minded fool must not understand anything. How could he not understand that I was with you all this time? By the way, how do you like our latest experience? Jane giggled in response. Darling, it was amazing. 
you're a lot better than Bill. But listen, we only have time for one round before you have to leave. Bill will be back around five, and I need to clean up, take a shower, and cool off before the performance. It's easy for you. You have servants in the mansion who can handle all this. By the way, when can I visit the spa at your house again? Jack sighed. Jane, you know it's hard for me to have guests in my house. There are too many servants there, and Elaine, my wife, could show up at any moment. But I promise that one day we can be there together all the time. My existence as I understood it came to an end. Everything unfolded right beside me, ringing in my ears. It's baffling why I didn't explode with anger and storm into the house immediately. Well, one reason is clear. I'm not the confrontational type. Another reason is that this revelation left me trembling and barely able to speak coherently. The nausea in the pit of my stomach seemed to pierce through to my very soul. I was frozen, almost in a state of paralysis. What snapped me out of my stupor was the sound of the cheaters at it again. This time I had the presence of mind to discreetly grab my phone and position it just above the windowsill. I might need this video evidence later. At that moment, returning to work appeared to be the only viable option. So I did. Brian was there wearing a solemn expression. What's wrong? I inquired. Has John noticed my absence and now wants to retract the bonus? He gazed at me with sorrow in his eyes. No, it's worse than that. I witnessed exactly what occurred at your place. I saw the sheer horror on your face as you stood outside your bedroom window. I watched you, unmoving for what felt like an eternity, then slowly reach for your phone and aim it inward. I'm sorry, buddy. I can only imagine what you witnessed and heard from inside your house. I may not understand your pain, but if there's anything I can do to help, just say the word. He embraced me briefly before returning to his screen. Oh, and by the way, the Porsche departed about 10 minutes after you did and is currently heading south on the freeway. In case you're interested, he added mischievously. I promptly adjusted the PE's camera to keep tabs on the culprit. Eventually, he pulled up at a rural mansion roughly 20 kilometers out of town. I now know where that jerk lives, I muttered to the empty space around me. Brian wisely refrained from commenting, but let out a small chuckle. He understood me all too well. My boss, John, wasn't thrilled about my request for a week off, especially during this critical stage of the project, but he said he understood. He mentioned that his son had recently faced a similar situation. I need my team members to be completely focused while they're here, Bill. I know if you were here in this state, you'd be of little use. Go sort out what needs to be done and come back ready to work. I thanked him and shook his hand. Brian waved as I left. Now what to do? Spending the time at home wasn't an option. I needed a place to stay while I pretended to be at work. There was a cheap motel nearby. It would have to suffice. Its dismal appearance matched my mood perfectly. Unsure of what to do next, I decided my first step should be consulting a lawyer. But which one? I had no contacts. Flipping through the motel's phone book, I randomly selected one nearby. Mr. James Whitmore. As luck would have it, he could see me that very afternoon due to a cancellation. Apparently, the couple he was supposed to meet had reconciled. Could I reconcile with Jane after what I'd seen and heard? Unlikely. My resentment towards her was growing. And as for the man who was involved with my wife, I wanted to address that later. For now, I needed to hear my legal options from someone knowledgeable, I thought. The initial inquiry I'd like you to address, Mr. Yates, is this. What are your desires? Are you inclined towards potential reconciliation, or are you seeking an exit? Your response will dictate your subsequent actions. After a brief pause, I replied, I desire an exit. Witnessing what I did, I could never entertain the notion of reuniting with Jane. The trust is irreparably shattered. Every time I'd look at her, all I'd see is her and that despicable Jack betraying our marriage vows on our own bed. No, an exit is what I seek. Can you facilitate that? The sooner the better. I could sense the growing animosity, and Mr. Whitmore seemed to pick up on it too. I advise against going rogue, Mr. Yates, he said. It rarely ends well, and the party seeking vengeance usually comes out worse.
there are plenty of proactive steps you can take now to safeguard yourself and your future. It'll keep you occupied and distract you from thoughts of retaliation. Let's ensure everything remains above board, shall we? He handed me a list of tasks to address promptly. Good grief, I mused. There's even a pre-prepared list. Divorce proceedings are insane. After leaving his office with a list in hand, I embarked on completing tasks while he prepared necessary documents. A significant portion of the list focused on finances, determining available cash, identifying the primary credit card holder, assessing long-term investments and their ownership, checking superannuation fund details including beneficiaries, confirming phone plan ownership, house ownership, and insurance policies. It was a lengthy list indeed. Mr. Whitmore's warning about its absorbing nature became clear. It left little room for thoughts of revenge. I was scheduled to meet him the following day, armed with as much information as possible. That day was consumed with calls to banks, insurance companies, utilities, and vehicle registration offices. By my usual home time, I had tackled most of the list's demands, leaving only the remaining tasks to address that evening with paperwork from our filing cabinet. Jane greeted me at the door in her usual manner, but this time I refrained from trying to kiss her. I knew where her lips were all day long. She hesitated for a moment because I deviated from our usual kiss exchange, but quickly continued her monologue about how her day had gone. Dinner was held in relative silence. Jane noted my depressed behavior, which I brushed off, citing work-related problems. By the way, Jane, I may need to find some documents in the file cabinet tonight. The HR department requires paperwork related to my original employment contract, I said. She agreed and left to clean herself up. I left and rummaged in the closet for the necessary documents that my lawyer demanded. By 10 o'clock in the evening, I had collected everything I needed. Jane was already in bed, probably recuperating after cheating on me all day. Sleep came quickly and unexpectedly, fortunately for me. The individual involved in an affair with your spouse is Mr. Jack Johnson, an esquire. He, or rather his family, possesses a vast estate just outside of town on Lowe's Lane. Residing there are Mr. Johnson, his wife Elaine, and his mother Joan, along with five live in servants. Rumor has it that the family's net worth is approximately $85 million primarily invested in stocks and bonds, alongside a prosperous financial firm named Johnson's Investments, Mr. Whitmore disclosed as we convened the following day. Have you completed the list? I felt like a student submitting an assignment. Yes, sir, it's all done. I handed him the paperwork. Ah, splendid. We can initiate the divorce proceedings today. When would you like to have her served? The earliest would be Friday, he inquired, looking expectantly at me. Could it be arranged for the weekend? Jane has an important event on Saturday, and I believe the Johnsons will be attending. It's a significant fundraising affair organized by Jane this time. I think it would be quite satisfying for me if it happened then, I proposed. Mr. Whitmore regarded me with curiosity, then flashed a smile. Certainly. I believe that can be arranged. It might even resolve two issues at once, as they say. It will put an end to your sham of a marriage, and you'll exact some form of revenge simultaneously. All perfectly legal and transparent. Excellent. It's settled then. I'll schedule the court server to arrive around 9 o'clock. By then, everyone should be seated for refreshments. He stood up, shook my hand, and I departed. Jane seemed more excited about this event than any I've seen her plan before. There will be many important guests, Jack, she announced eagerly. Will you be attending? You don't have to if you'd rather not. I'd met her gaze. Well, isn't that a surprise? I mused internally. She doesn't want me there because her lover will be present. I looked directly into her eyes and replied, Thank you, Jane. I don't think I'll be able to make it this time. She nearly visibly sighed with relief. I could see it in her eyes. Oh, what a pity. Perhaps next time, her mouth said, but her eyes communicated. Thank goodness. Fortunately for me, Jane was occupied for the remainder of the week with various tasks and appointments. With all her organizing and arranging, I wondered how she'd find time for any extracurricular activities, especially with that scoundrel Jack.
Her absence provided me the opportunity to gradually move my belongings out of the house and into my modest motel room. I'm certain the motel owner must have been curious about my intentions as he witnessed me hauling load after load into the tiny space. I reassured him it was only temporary, knowing I'd soon need to find a more permanent residence. I left behind some items in the house to avoid raising suspicion too quickly. While Jane didn't seem to notice much, she did remark that the house seemed neater lately. On Friday morning, I informed her I had the day off and planned to rearrange some things around the house. She appeared anxious, perhaps not about my plans, but rather about hers and Jack's. All right, Bill. I have to make a call, but I'll be out all day. Sorry I can't stay and help. She hurriedly excused herself, retreating to our bedroom where I overheard her conversation. No, Jack. Not here today. I know it's been a while, but where can we meet? Yes, I'm familiar with that motel, though it's a bit run down. Are you certain? All right. Ten it is. Bye, lover. I chuckled to myself silently. Could it really be the same place I'm staying in? I wondered. Well, this might turn out to be entertaining. As Jane kept busy at home, I busied myself moving my belongings around, giving the impression that I was simply tidying up. She left at 9.30. At 10, I called the motel and spoke to the manager, whom I was starting to know quite well. I'd inquired about a couple in a black port sheet with the license plate VBG 385. He confirmed their arrival and questioned how I knew their plate. I explained that the car had been monitored by my government agency and was rumored to belong to a local underworld figure. I advised him to be cautious. He thanked me and ended the call. Next, I anonymously contacted the local TV station tipping them off about an imminent prohibited substances bust at a specific motel providing details. They expressed gratitude and likely dispatched a film crew promptly. The police were highly interested in my report of a prohibited substance transaction I had witnessed in the motel's parking lot. The mention of the black Porsche, a clear indicator of a prohibited substances dealer's vehicle, immediately piqued their interest. I even provided them with the room number where I had allegedly seen the dealers enter. I could almost hear the alarm bells ringing as the desk surgeon hung up the phone. The scene unfolding at the motel within the next hour could easily be the plot of a gripping crime film. The film crew arrived first, catching the motel manager for an interview just as the police arrived in a dramatic fashion. With sirens blaring, patrol cars encircled the parking lot, while a SWAT armored vehicle delivered a squad of fully armed officers dressed in black. They quickly positioned themselves in a semicircle around the door of the motel room, where Jack and Jane had been conducting their illicit activities. Additional officers stealthily moved around the back of the building, anticipating any potential escape routes for the suspected prohibited substances dealers. A booming voice through a megaphone commanded, Occupants of room 69, this is the police. Come out with your hands raised above your heads. The hesitant movement of the curtain behind the window of room 69 was captured by the film crew. After no one emerged, a member of the SWAT team approached the front door. With a signal to his backup, he forcefully pushed open the door and tossed in a smoke grenade. As soon as the grenade detonated, the rest of the team rushed in. The noise was overwhelming. The film crew was capturing every moment of the action. This is going to make for great footage, the reporter thought. The first two SWAT officers left the room, followed by two people who were clearly scared and without clothes. My wife Jane, who I discovered was cheating on me, was desperately trying to hide her appearance, while Jack, the jerk, kept his head down. They were quickly escorted to different police cars disappointing curious onlookers who had hoped for a bigger spectacle from the suspects. The Porsche was attached to one of the Special Forces armored vehicles and towed to the police department for inspection. A group of forensic police officers, all in protective gear, entered the motel room and came out with sealed evidence bags. The whole process, including the camera interviews, was completed quickly. Meanwhile, sitting in my car parked across the street, I was shaking with laughter. If any of the patrolmen had noticed me, I'm sure I would have been detained for questioning too. Upon returning home promptly, I feigned engagement in the task I had mentioned to Jane earlier, reorganizing my belongings. 
Jane didn't arrive until 10 in the evening, by which time I was comfortably settled in bed. I couldn't help but notice, albeit discreetly, that she was wearing different attire from earlier in the day. Needless to say, the following morning's breakfast conversation was rather peculiar. Good morning, Jane. I greeted her with forced cheerfulness. How did the preparations for yesterday's fundraiser go? Fairly well, Bill, she replied indistinctly, her back turned to me. Did you happen to catch the news? No, I'm sorry, Jane, no time. Maybe tonight while you're at the fundraiser, I replied, then left the kitchen to tend to some overdue yard maintenance. We had separate lunches, Jane while dressing up and me in the garage. Jane left at four, giving a quick wave. Boy, did she look stunning. She always turned heads, and I couldn't resist stealing one last glance at my soon-to-be ex-wife. Her dress was exquisite, accentuating all the right curves, from her supply protruding breasts to the smooth curve of her hips down to her long, tanned legs. Her hair perfectly complemented the attire, formal, yet with a playful tuft near her ears hinting at mischief. She carried her FMP shoes in her hands while wearing regular joggers. Her flawless face enhanced by makeup highlighted her red lips with just the right shade of color and gloss. I stared shamelessly, and I think I caught her stealing a glance back at me before she hurried to her car and was gone. I felt a surge of sadness at losing my wife, but recent events reignited feelings of anger and resentment. I screamed, a lying, cheating, and vile woman. Perhaps some neighbors wondered about the outburst. When I arrived at the fundraiser, the event was already in full swing and I was dressed in my tuxedo. The doorman promptly ushered me in without hesitation, indicating that all the key guests had already arrived and were seated according to their assigned positions. Finding an empty seat in the rear corner of the hall, I settled in, strategically positioned behind a rather large woman, ensuring my presence remained discreet. As the waiter delivered my first bourbon of the evening, I couldn't help but mull over the likelihood of this drink being in high demand. With a wreath out, I messaged the dubious individual I had enlisted two days prior, signaling my readiness and prompting him to be prepared. Ladies and gentlemen, to kick off tonight's festivities, I'd like to recognize the incredible individuals behind it all. So I invite you all to raise your glasses as we acknowledge Mr. Jack Johnson, ESQ, and his dedicated coordinator. Mrs. Jane Yates. Let's give them a round of applause. As the announcement was made, large screens illuminated with close-up portraits of the two honorees, placed strategically around the hall. The monitors ensured that everyone could witness in high definition what was occurring at the main table center, where Jane and Jack stood. Live cameras alternated between their faces, capturing the moment. Jack had his arm around Jane's waist, while she gently rested her hand on his shoulder a posture suggesting a deep comfort and perhaps intimacy between the two. My rage reached its peak, yet instead of erupting into shouts and screams at the two deceivers, I calmly sent a text saying, Go! As the MC continued praising the charitable deeds of these seemingly noble individuals and was on the verge of proposing a toast, a profound silence fell over the room. It was soon punctuated by gasps and exclamations of, Oh no! and oh my god, followed by accusations of the adulterer and the unfaithful scoundrel. Jack and Jane didn't pay attention to the unfolding events until they looked at one of the monitors. Jane pressed her hands to her mouth, unable to hide her shock, and turned abruptly pale. She leaned back in her chair, leaning her head on the exquisitely decorated banquet table, and almost knocked over a half-filled glass of water, but did not drink the wine an exquisite Cabernet Sauvignon from the Australian Barossa region. The wine spilled, staining her elegant dress with scarlet spots resembling blood. Meanwhile, Jack was paralyzed, his gaze riveted to the monitors that displayed the entire room, including footage of him and Jane cheating on their spouses. Suddenly, the volume increased, and their voices began to sound loud and clear so that everyone could hear their frank conversations, during which they insulted me in every possible way. The distinguished guests turned into nothing more than a restless crowd, shouting for an end to the riots and hurling insults at the two scammers, using expressions inappropriate for such a gathering. When Jack walked away from Jane with a loud noise, Jane quickly fulfilled her promise. The crowd had had enough.
They rushed to the exit while angry technicians frantically checked every computer, trying to figure out how their network had been hacked. I paid this specialist handsomely, I thought, pleased with the result. Finally, someone turned off all the monitors, plunging the room into darkness. As dark as my soul, Jack muttered. He calmly waited at the exit while the guests, whispering, left. Eventually, only Jack, Jane, and Jack's parents remained. As they approached the door, they suddenly noticed Bill. Hi, Jane, greeted Bill, handing her a yellow envelope, which she instinctively accepted. Before Jane could react, Bill snapped a photo with his camera. He then gave a similar envelope to Jack, who held it as if it were a live grenade, which figuratively it was. Another photo was taken. Now Bill had proof that both Jack and Jane had been formally served. That should have sufficed, but Bill couldn't resist. With clenched fists, he struck Jack squarely on the jaw, knowing he'd be nursing a swollen hand for weeks. Yet at that moment, the satisfaction on his face eclipsed any pain. Jack crumpled to the ground, prompting cries from his parents as they rushed to his side, checking if he was still breathing. He was. Well, I won't be facing murder charges, Bill thought, relieved. Jack's father stood tall and approached Bill. Oh, Bill thought, I'm in trouble now. Son, you've just done what I should have done to this sorry excuse for his son years ago. I apologize for his actions towards you and your marriage. We'll have a conversation later once I've dealt with this backwards idiot, whether it's taking him home or to the hospital. With that, he firmly guided Jack out of the building. Jane remained standing alone. She tried to make eye contact with Bill, but couldn't. Overwhelmed with shame and guilt, she collapsed to the floor, crying uncontrollably. Through her tears, she repeated the same words, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I stared down at her with a grim expression and uttered, You're not sorry at all. The way you treated me and our marriage leaves no room for genuine remorse. Your heart harbors only deceit, lies, infidelity, and betrayal. I can't fathom any justification for your actions, nor do I care to hear them, as it would mean listening to the lies that spill from your lips, lips that have kissed away the evidence of your unfaithfulness. How you explain your behavior to our children is your responsibility now. I've already spoken to them and explained why I'm leaving you. They were skeptical until I showed them evidence from the event your affluent friends attended tonight. Your parents are also disappointed and eager to talk to you. If you want to go back to the house, do so, but it's no longer my home. It's no longer our home. I now see it as a home of infidelity where you were the central figure. The neighbors are aware now too, thanks to the flashy car parked there. They might have something to say to you as well. If you need to communicate with me, do it through my lawyer. You made your choices. Now you must face the consequences. My voice rose with each word, a necessary release for the anger and hatred that had consumed me. I left her there on the floor, a shattered woman, shattered much like my heart was from the recent revelation of what I once believed to be a solid marriage. Three months later, Jack's father reached out to me requesting a meeting at his home. Intrigued, I accepted. He wasted no time in getting to the point. Mr. Yates, thank you for coming. It took me some time to gather the courage to invite you and share what has transpired since the revelation. I've removed Jack from my will, a decision he's been made aware of by our lawyer. The poor she has found a new owner, one of my nieces who is studying law. He paused, noticing my agreement. However, no amount of punitive action towards my son can heal the wound in your heart. For that, I am deeply sorry. While I know I have not to blame for the deceit of these two individuals, my sense of justice compels me to take action. With that, he handed me a sealed envelope. Please wait until you're home, enjoying a nice bourbon before opening it. He shook my hand and escorted me to the door. You're always welcome here, should you ever feel the need. The door closed behind me, and another sound followed. With the bourbon in my hand, I opened the envelope and found the check. Not just a check, but a check for a million dollars. There was a note attached to it. Bill, we both acknowledge the actions of your wife, who in pursuit of wealth entered into a disorderly relationship with my son. As a rule, the lady receives the payment, but I decided to change this rule. I want you to be compensated. 
According to my son, your ex-wife, and he had been in a secret relationship for about five years. That's $200,000 a year. Presumably, they engaged in meetings four times a week for a total of about 200 times a year. Therefore, I am paying you compensation in the amount of $1,000 for each case of their contact. This form of compensation may appear unusual, but I believe our family is deeply indebted to you. Many betrayed husbands might have sought retribution through unsavory means, yet you chose to uphold the law and maintain your integrity throughout. Go forth and forge a fulfilling life with the time you have left. I genuinely meant my offer for you to visit me any time. It would be an honor to share a bourbon with someone of your caliber. Sincerely, James Whitmore. Well, I'll be damned, exclaimed Bill, raising his glass of bourbon. I know just the yacht with my name written all over it in the Florida Keys. Jane currently resides in Atlanta, working as a waitress at any cafe willing to hire her. Neither her children nor Bill have received any communication from her. Jack seems to have vanished completely. Bill frequently programmed his car's navigation system with James Whitmore's address and would often visit to share a bourbon. Although he no longer works for NASA, his name is featured on numerous fishing honor boards at various local bars in Florida. Thanks to everyone who took the time to listen to today's stories. If you enjoyed it, please consider liking and subscribing if you haven't already. Feel free to share your thoughts on the events in the comments below. Take care.